There you go. Music from Seahorses and two of the band members are here with us on the program tonight. And that's uh, John and Chris. John, you're very welcome to the program and Chris as well. Now, let's start at the beginning, which, the, which is the band, which is Seahorses. I mean, John, an obvious question. How did it all get together? Well, was it a decision in March 96? I'm going somewhere else. Let's see who, who I can find. Will I go for famous names? Will I go for not famous names? What were you thinking of at the end of the Stone Roses? Uh, I wasn't thinking immediately about forming a new band. It foisted itself upon me. The night I left the Stone Roses, I bumped into Stuart, which was entirely by coincidence. And a friend of a friend passed on a tape of Chris, who we'd seen busking outside Woolworths in York. And we took it from there. And over the period, say, of the last nine months or thereabouts, like, I mean, has it worked out as well as you could possibly have expected? Better. The music's far better than I expected for a new group. I'm really pleased with the sound of the album. And what about the chemistry? That's getting there. It was a little strange at first, because obviously the Roses had been together for ten years and we had our own language and code of conduct. And I felt a little bit like an outsider at first, but... It's going to be more like a gang every day. Well, what about you, Chris? I mean, how did you actually get involved? I mean, is, is it true that you were busking outside Woolworths? Some guy comes up with a tape, hand. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was I was busking outside of Woolworths, and um, <clears throat> I mean, the thing was, I wasn't even going to go out that day, so I was all right for money that day. But uh, as it turned out, I didn't want to break into the tenor, so I just needed my bus fare home. Really, started busking, and uh, this bloke came up who was a friend of a friend of John's, and um, said that. He liked what I was doing and could I give him a tape? But I thought it was going to be for some working men's club or something like that, you know. But as it turned out, it was quite fortunate that he walked past when he did, for me anyway. Right. And John, is the is the idea with the band now, is it the same though as it was with the Stone Roses? I mean, like at, at the start of the Stone Roses, you were all mates and then whatever happened, happened. Mm. Until a five year gap between album one and two, all that sort of thing. But I mean, is it a question now that like you could get on better with these guys because you'd never let the madness that came towards the Roses, say in 94 to 96, happen again? You can't really prepare against that. There's, there's nothing to say that it won't happen again. You never know. I hope not. But it's, it is different because the, ro the Roses we were all friends before we started I mean, the band. Yeah. This is the the inverse of that equation. And what about the other side of that equation as well, the third side, which is we all friends at the end of the Roses. Or is, is it a bad scene? Um, I'm friends with Ronnie. Yeah. That's it. That's about it. Yeah. But I mean, like the Roses were seen as four guys and you two then, I mean, obviously Ian and yourself in some ways as the main two. Whether you like it or not now, like you're the leader of a band now. Are you, are you, are you going to say, no, I'm just one of four? <laughs> um, I do carry a certain amount of weight, yeah. I, I don't like to think of myself as a leader. I don't want to stifle anyone else's creativity. Chris writes songs as well. and I'm, Yeah. It's a treat for me to work with someone else that does write songs. And in that working, did you decide to go to LA to do the to do the album over there for any reason other than that's where Tony Visconti was? Or? No, he, he lives in New York. He had to um, pack his bags and move to LA as well. The main reason was a, a technical one. It was a particular sort of desk, kind of desk they've got in Rockfield in Wales yeah. where we did the second coming and I didn't want to go back there, so... There were a few other places. There were two studios in LA and there was one in Bearsville, which is upstate New yeah. York, which we were told was going to be about 20 below that time of year. So it's too cold. We plumped <laughs> for the California option. Yeah, right. Okay, well then, what did you think that you were going to have with the other guys? I mean, did you have a bunch of songs ready? Had you got a bunch of songs stacked up from the roses that you hadn't used in Second Coming? So I had one song that I'd written for Second Coming and held back because things were going so slowly. I didn't want to slow it down anymore by introducing more material. But that aside, I think I wrote eight or nine songs before I met Chris. That was pretty much a deluge of material after leaving. Yeah. I found myself on my own with a guitar and I was living on my own at the time. And all this material just poured out. Well, what about you, Chris? I mean, you've got songs on this that are specifically written by you as well. Yeah. So had you, had you got them, like, I mean, did you busk them down through the last couple of years and, hey, now I can use them on an album? Yeah. 
<laughs> well, so some of them are too dark to, to I mean there's one hello I wrote that when we were rehearsing in the Lake District but um, it's like Blinded by the Sun I wrote when I was living in Brighton and uh, moving on that's a B-side I wrote that one come back from France uh, so they're all pretty well they're about a year and a half old knocking on for two years okay well let's play one of those now this is Blinded by the Sun that was Blinded by the Sun, that is Seahorses, that is from the debut album, which is now out this week. Now, the thing about it is, is that do you collaborate on writing? We've started to now, but none of the songs, apart from I Want You To Know, which is a collaboration between Chris and Stuart, the bass player, we, we just took the, the material we'd written, offered it to each other, learn it and we transplanted the whole operation from the Lake District into Los Angeles and recorded it as quickly as possible. So there wasn't really time to write together. We just wanted to record what we had. And is that something you just wanted to do or did you genuinely feel some sort of massive surge of creativity going, wow, this was a good idea. It's working out really well over here in LA. Let's see, let's see what happens next. In other words, did it work out really well in LA as far as you're concerned? Far better than I expected or anticipated, yeah. And is one of the criteria there, it, 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 like would it be that the fact that it was done in this pretty quick space of time, which is not exactly sort of a thing we associate with what you've been doing, say, since 1990? Something I'm very pleased about. <laughs> that wasn't meant to be sound as cruel as it might have. <laughs> yeah, I'm very pleased with the way it went. I much prefer working at that speed. Though at times it did seem a little bit strange. I felt cheated in some ways that I wasn't getting my time at the mic, you know. Yeah. I like that. I like the attention when you get when the red light goes on and you're recording. Right. I mean, in some ways, like, do it you think you fly by this time? Well, do you think you paid certain dues in terms of like the mistakes people make or in just the waiting around or just you've had your four or five years of this is not the way to make an album as in the second coming, right? Mm. So, so you, you just it wasn't to... five years. So we didn't start recording it until. No, but between about albums. About a year before it was released. Between albums, it was a long time. Yeah. And did it just stop being fun after a while? Or was it just that there was too many guys in suits and too much record company nonsense and just too much hassle and maybe even bit no, of a scare, it, too much too much expectation. No, I don't think it was that. We just lost momentum with all the legal battles we got involved in. Channeled too much energy into that. Championing the cause. I'm still proud of the fact that we've changed the um, the standard contracts in Britain as a result of the case we fought against Zomba. Yeah. New bands don't get such a lousy deal anymore. But you went all the way in terms of fighting thing. I mean, you you actually um, yeah, we were determined. You know, we we were quite prepared to retire as commercial musicians and just play live. Because if we'd lost that case, they could have insisted that we continue to record for them. Yeah, and they'd have had a legal right to demand that we don't work for anybody else. So we would have been finished basically. Yeah. Yeah. What about the whole idea of, um, like, of say finding other members of the band? Like Chris is one. Like, how did you, like, up in York, you found Stuart? Mm -hmm. How exactly did he come across? I and mean, was it some sort of a, I don't know, was it? Was it was it? just a drink. I went, I went to get slaughtered after uh, leaving the Roses. Yeah. Went drinking with a friend. Yeah. And uh, Stuart was standing in with a blues covers band. It was his first gig. Yeah. And. I was really impressed with the way he played, although, as I said earlier, I wasn't out recruiting that night. He right. just, his name and his face stuck with me, and about a week later I got in touch and gave him a few songs, and he he put he put down some really nice bass lines, and he was in. And what about Mr. Watts? Where did he come from? Um, he gets around, Andy, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> Wherever he goes, it's like I was brought up here, you know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> He knows all the best pubs. <laughs> He's from the North East. I think he was, he was brought up in Durham. He lives in London at the moment. And was there in any way at all any kind of a thing whereby you could have gone with some more famous musicians and you might have wanted to do that? No, it didn't really interest me. I wanted a fresh start. I wanted to be as close as it possibly can be to a new band with, not, with my name associated. I know it's not that easy, but... 
short of extensive plastic surgery. Right, yeah. And what about the whole idea then of like getting lots of other offers from say like come, come in and do a Bernard Butler sort of ex suede or Johnny Marr, ex Smiths kind of thing. I mean the big famous guest guitarist kind of person. Doesn't appeal to me. I'm too much of a private individual for that, I think. Yeah. And I've always wanted to be part of a band, not some sort of temporary fixture. Yeah. There was some interest from uh, Beck's management, because we're on the same label, when they found out I was free and Beck was about to do a world tour. I think that was probably a hired gun scenario, but didn't really appeal. Like one of the gigs, I, I, I only saw the Stone Roses live once and I just thought it was a brilliant gig which was in Fela in Thurlis about mm -hmm. two years ago or so. I mean, somebody I think from the band has said that that was one of the highlights in terms of live. Was it a good one for you? It was, yeah, it was great. Because then you went, you, did you do Reading or something after that and it wasn't so good or was that, that was... That was after I'd left. That was after you, you, yeah. you were gone, yeah. And that was the new members and it was pretty sort of shambolic to say the least, I believe. That's what I've heard. I didn't bother myself. I went shopping that day. <laughs> what about when you played at Nebworth? I mean, is there, was there any way to bring back feelings of this is what it's meant to be all about, or this is good fun, or hey, I remember Spike Island, or anything like that? No, not really. I had the runs for those two days. So I was stuffed full of diacams and hoping for no accidents. And was it easy? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was a shame I'd come off so soon, because I... I got on there for 10 minutes and it was all over. You know, it seemed like I took my cue, played a song and then the fireworks went off. And but could you get it together there at all? I mean, like, could you hear what, say, Bonehead was doing? Could you hear what Noel was doing? Could you hear the orchestra? Could, 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 could you, like, like, somebody told me that really you didn't know what was going on at the time. The only person you could hear was Noel properly. I could hear the drums, yeah. Noel has a lot of amps on stage. Right, yeah. I've heard the record, though. It seems like I did pretty well. Right, that's fair enough. Okay, well, then, what, what about this business of auditioning people? Did you audition people from Dublin? We, for the drums, I think. We did, yeah. Yeah. So, hold on, Chris. You, you, you were on board at that stage to get a drummer. Was the drummer the last thing? Is that the point? It was, yeah. Yeah, it was just... We spent six months without a drummer rehearsing. I think we tried about 15. It was really difficult because we wanted a singing drummer, we wanted harmonies, and uh, I sing like a dog, and Stuart doesn't sing at all. You can sing if you smoke too many cigarettes, so and you think he wants to carry on doing that and rather not sing, so yeah. get him on a health farm or something. Yeah. Chris, do you get the old, I mean, already even, like the, 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 the comparisons with Stone Rose in terms of the fact that to be blunt, I mean, even though I did like Ian Brown's voice in terms of the whole sound of Stone Roses, I mean... I don't know what it means to say somebody can't really sing very well. Uh, let's, let's, let's put it this way. Like, I mean, I don't think Bob Dylan can sing very well, but he's one of my favourite vocalists of the last 30 years. So, like, I mean, you can yeah. sing. So, I mean, do, 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 you, do you ever feel, well, you're bringing something very different to what John Squire does on, on, the, on the guitar, at least on that level? Uh, I don't think <coughs> it's fair to make any comparisons between me, yeah. and, me and Ian. Anyway, I've never met him, but I liked his voice as well, you know. In the stone, in stone roses. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I can sing, so can he, you know, whatever. Right. Do you feel much more relaxed now, John? I mean, that's something is that you took a chance on about, say, six or eight or nine months ago. It's working out, as you say, as well as it could be expected, if not ten times better. And this is, like, this is a nice way to feel. Like, do you feel better in 97, let's say, than you did in 94, 95? Yeah, an awful lot better. But that, that feeling came to me as soon as I made the decision to leave. Right. And what did make you make that final decision to leave? I mean, the second coming was actually quite well received by a lot of people. I mean, like, you could never have lived up to the supposed expectations of what people might have wanted. Oh, it was nothing to do with the reaction to the record. And it was well after the release of the album that I decided to leave. I just didn't enjoy touring with the band. It didn't feel like a set of friends anymore. It felt like work. And it was work that I didn't want to do. So My heart wasn't in it, and I think, I believe you've got to follow your heart. Yeah. Some people say that you were, like, willfully just trying to sort of make a statement to say, look, this is just, it's too late, it's all sort of gone. I mean, and, you, and you released the second album, the second coming, 
in December, which is not exactly the most clever month to supposedly release an album like that when it's just all greatest hits and things, and you know, that's the usual Christmas market takes over. And if you think in any way in terms of charts, and you want to get to number one, okay, it did get to number one, but I mean, you want to sort of make... You know, no, we were, just, we were just fully aware that we'd spent a long time overworking the record in the studio, and as soon as it was ready for the fans to listen to, we saw it as our duty to put it out. There's no point in going for the marketing strategy of waiting a couple of months and getting a, a respectable chart position. It wouldn't have made his sound any better. Well, do you ever feel you had lost anything? I mean, even the way to present yourself, or maybe you couldn't or wouldn't, or you didn't even have the sort of guts, if you like, to live up to the reputation, or did, did those things come into it at all? I mean, there's a lot of pressure. I mean, like, the enemy went as far as, like, undercover agents trying to look into your studio to see what you were doing. There was mm. wild scenes going on. I mean, the Stone Roses' first album was one of the biggest albums in the history of rock, certainly of the last 10 years, obviously. And the expectation for number two was just so big. Did that expectation from other people in any way encroach on any decisions you might have made or any sort of depression you might have felt? Hey, that was a pretty good question, wasn't it? Sorry, <laughs> um, I don't think so. We were pretty much isolated in that studio. Obviously, we saw the articles when they came out on the enemy covers, but it was very flattering and encouraging, if anything. Yeah. But there was still that level of interest after four years or whatever it was. And is there any one point you could look at and say, right, that was it, gone, time to go? Ren I mean, Rennie left the band. If, if anybody with the benefit of hindsight i can see that as a a fatal wound but at the time i didn't realize that and there was nothing to do nothing we could do about it anyway because rennie was losing interest yeah so and I, he wanted to leave and i feel he had a right to leave okay if the impossible had happened or could happen in say march 96 or in the, at the start of 96 and you could actually stop time and turn back the clock and go back to say around 92 a year or two after the first album and getting ready for a second album and no hassles with record companies if you could have got over that or if you had the chance to do what you're doing now which is go on to seahorses do you think in any way you would have picked the former uh well yeah i would you would after a, a great first album, no assholes, into the second album. Yeah, I'd have done that. Why would I have left? Because the, the, like, the impossibility, possibly, of early 96, <coughs> of never, you could never see how you could work with these four guys again, in that, like, one was going in a different direction, one was given up, you were hassling with another one, maybe. Well, maybe that was the lifetime, the lifespan of the band, irregardless of how many records we made. Yeah. Maybe it was. We started in '84, finished effectively in '96. So maybe that was the. So maybe that was the lifespan of the band. We could have made ten records. We made two. Right. And what about the lifetime of this band? I mean, is it possible that, like, I mean, obviously this album is going to go into the top of the charts of Brazil and all the rest of it, and you're going to get the hit singles, etc. But what about 12 months' time that it's a possibility that maybe people won't grab onto album two and three or whatever? So be it. That's part of the attraction of the job. Nothing's guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, what you're doing now is that you're playing good quality guitar music, pop music, rock music, whatever you want to call it, and that's what you were doing in the past as well. Do you think in some ways that you did bring the guitar back into music in the 90s? And that even, like, I know you're not going to say Oasis wouldn't have happened without us, but to an extent that the audience mightn't have been ready. I mean, for instance, like, the fact that Nirvana got to number one in, in the charts and Michael Jackson and Celine Dion behind him in America, behind him in America in the early 90s, whether they like it or not, they opened a few doors to oh, bring yeah. guitar music back into a mainstream or whatever. Now, in the same way in this part of the world... We did that in our own small way, I agree. Yeah. I mean, like even Britpop or whatever you want to call it, mightn't have happened at all if it hadn't been for the Stone Roses first. Because like what you were doing in 1989, 1990 wasn't necessarily, it, certainly, it was seen as an indie thing basically, it certainly wasn't mm. a hugely popular thing. Yeah, it was very difficult to break through, even the record company didn't see what they had on their hands. They neglected to make videos for the first two singles, but only caught the drift of what was happening around the third one, I think, She Bangs the Drums, they made a video for that. Yeah which didn't get much exposure and there were some great songs there that fell by the wayside for the want of a bit of promotion. 
Do you think in some ways that if people point towards that first album, and they really do as being this amazing, like I mean, in the line of Pet Sounds to Sgt. Pepper, it's up there in the top 10 albums of all time or whatever. Do you think that's a bit of an albatross around your neck in some ways? Like, look, wait a minute, it was just a good album with some good songs. Like, let's not lose our life over this one. No, I agree. It's a great album. (laughs) It's the kind of albatross I like to wear. Yeah, right. Is it fair to say that there's less guitar on this album, which might surprise some people, than there was on the second coming. Mm, yeah. What do you think, It's fair to say. There's not so much layering going on at all. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's not as heavy either. I mean, it's not as Zeppelin-y, which certainly some tracks. Like, I mean, Gone South or something on the second album. Right? I still love Zeppelin. Yeah. I love playing the guitar. I love rock. I love rock and roll. I love the rock sound of the guitar. Right. I'm never going to detach myself from that. Do you think the whole dance thing, that like maybe Stone Roses were a little too dancey for you and maybe not enough guitar in some way, especially in the first bits? No, I was into it. I was into what was going on. Phil's Gold was my idea. It was, I found the, the drum loop, built the song up around that. I admit I wasn't as excited by it as some members of the band, but... Yeah, I was up for it. I do set, I, I do lean more towards melody, lyric and song than I do rhythm. When you say collaborations are going to happen now, do collaborations happen in the past that like it looked to me or uh, so much time, it's just so much easier. Like if you ever heard John Lennon singing, you know that he wrote the song. If you heard Paul McCarthy singing, you know that he wrote the song, even though it was Lennon McCarthy. Mm. That's usually the dipstick there or, or whatever. Now the, there's a few other things, so, like there's a few other examples down through the years that you always say this. But I mean, did you write the music in the Stone Roses and did he, Ian, write the lyrics? No, I wrote a lot of the lyrics. That's what I thought, yeah. yeah. But do you find that people think that you wrote the music and... Yeah, that's the natural assumption. Yeah. Yeah. But this time around, collaboration-wise, it's anything goes. It's just whacking it. I mean, like, when you went to the studios in LA, did you have all those songs ready or did you write in the studio? They're all pretty much ready, were they? Yeah, Chris wrote a couple while we were over there, but I just concentrated on my guitar overdubs. Yeah. Yeah, they were all ready, finished lyrics, everything. Okay, well then speaking of lyrics, what about a song like The Boy in the Picture? How autobiographical might that be or could that be? Oh, it's thoroughly autobiographical. Is it? Yeah, it's inspired by a picture that my dad gave me of me and my brother. I think we were about seven and five on the beach in Landudno with a couple of donkeys. And right. I kept, I hung on the wall on the landing upstairs and I kept walking past it every day and wondered what it'd be like to talk to that person in the picture. I talk to the pair of us and give them advice from the future, send it back through the past. All right, well, let's, let's listen to that one now. This is called The Boy in the Picture. Uh, Do It Yourself is the album. This is The Seahorses. In England. The English want to release it. The English record company want to release it. I think the Americans want to put out... Um, The weight of expectation, like th- th- that's actually quite good to be in that position. One, it's it's a completely different road in Britain, and it's a different road again in America. It's yeah. kind of nice. I mean, like, I'd say even road two for you, Chris, would be the nicer one in some ways. Mm. What you mean? They're not somebody to jump on you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're not looking at every single move and say, ah, you know, Ian Brown might not be able to sing, but I mean, the, you know, the chemistry. <laughs> Yeah, you're probably right. I don't know. I don't really have much notice. Them. I think we'll get a fairer hearing in America. Yeah. We'll get more of an idea of what people think about the band and less of an idea about what they used to think about the Stone Roses. Did, did Tony Visconti play on the album? He did, yeah. He played um, Mellotron. He played a, an Indian instrument called the tambora. It's like a bass sitar. Yeah. Uh, he conducted and arranged the strings on, I think there were strings on the last track. Yeah. Um, what else did he play? Um, theremin. Theremin, yeah. Yeah. That was uh, interesting. An electronic instrument. Great, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> 
And any reason to pick Tony Visconti was one of the reasons because he's a strings man, or he certainly knows how it works. Work, work. I mean, like, did you know the Bowie albums that he did? Did you know the Mark Boland all the rest? Yeah, I was uh, I was well into the Mark Boland stuff he did. I, I like the drum sounds actually. The strings wasn't a a major concern, although it did interest me when he mentioned that it was one of his fortes. Yeah, oh, it's a really listen out for the strings on T Rex stuff. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, it was exciting to watch it going down there. Yeah. And was it exciting when you came across this guy then eventually? I mean, like, if this guy gives you a tape and says, this busker outside Woolworths is pretty cool, but uh, you better go and check him out. I mean, when you went to check him out, one of the things he was doing was, which is not very, um, actually, put this, not very rock and roll. I mean, he's sitting on a seat in some pub or something, singing No Expectations from the Rolling Stones with his eyes shut. Uh, does, that, does that not make you look for the exit? Or, by the way, <laughs> were your eyes shut because you knew this guy was here checking you out? I was somewhere over. Really? Yeah. <laughs> did did you know he was that. there? I didn't know until I got... Well, I'd been at a party that night in Sleaford and I, I knew I had to get back to do a gig, but I thought, oh, well, it doesn't really matter because I didn't know John was coming down or anything. I stumbled through the door about an hour and a half late and he was sat down there and I was like, oh, shit, you know. But... um. I went up on stage anyway and I played, I think I did about three songs or something. I was very hungover. I had my eyes shut because it was just, I don't know, probably a bit of both really, being hungover and the presence of John being there and a lot of other people who I didn't know yeah. that were putting me under the microscope. It did bother me, I must <laughs> admit. Yeah. I want to see him a few more times to make sure that he... He had a pair of legs. All right, so the third or fourth time you see him, you kicked the stool from under his ass. He said, right, stand up there. <laughs> the other thing was, is that the mic wasn't set up for me to... Everybody else who was playing that night was sat on their asses as well, so... Yeah. It yeah. seemed like a... You know, sort of faffing around with a microphone stand just right, down yeah. with the rest of them. All right, well, look, I'll tell you what. Um, just finally then, do you think that it's more efficient the way it's going now, John, that it's more economical, the way the whole thing is working out. I mean, it's the, 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 you know, the pressure is sort of not the same thing in some ways, and expectations can go to hell. No expectations. <laughs> and just let's do it. It's more enjoyable. That's the main thing. That's the reason I started. Right. And that's the reason I intend to continue. Right. Well, listen, the very best of luck. Congratulations on the album, and uh, I'll be looking forward to albums 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Way, way, way on into the next millennium. Thank